Sorry, folks. We uh, restart. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the workshop on the Hanover. I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Neil Gershenbach. He is the director of the MIT Center for Data Analysis, and there's a PhD in applied physics from the University. He's a junior fellow at the University Society of Fellows, and a member of the research staff at the lab. At the Center for Bits Analysis, a unique lab that is breaking down bandwidth between the digital and the physical world, uh, compounding in quantum computing and computer application of the internet. Neil is also the founder of a global network of over 2,000 <coughs> FAD labs, that shows the FAD Foundation and meets the FAD account. He's been named one of the Scientific America's 50 leaders in science and technology, is one of 40 modern day Leonardo. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to have this gathering. Um, so what I'd like to do is note a number of assumptions throughout the morning and throughout discussion of computing and AI at MIT and globally and the opportunity of what lies looking beyond them. Uh, this is an essay I wrote for an interesting uh, book with an interesting group of people about AI. Depending on how you count, we're in the fifth boom-bust cycle of AI, where it's going to solve everything or it's a disaster. There have been about five of them. And, and they each go like this, and then they crash and go up. Right now, we're at the top of about the fifth one. But what's really happened is just this. If you look at ops per second in a brain, and you look at ops per second in a big computer, the ops per second in a big computer have caught up to the ops per second in a brain. And so we'd be derelict in what we're doing if the computer couldn't start to do things on the order of what the brain can do. It really isn't a revolution in any one thing. It's just decades of scaling have brought us up to machines that right now cost much more, way more, use more power, but do about the same ops per second. We shouldn't be surprised they can do a comparable task. Now, what that comparison misses is this is the one that I'm really interested in and want to talk about. Um, the, you know, a, an exaflop system is going to be about 10 to the 15 transistors. A petabyte is about 10 to the 16 transistors. Your state-of-the-art fab can make 10 to the 17 transistors per uh, month. Uh, right now, you're digesting your lunch. And when you're doing it, you have 10 to the 13 cells. There's about 10 to the 5 ribosomes per cell. Ribosomes run at 1 hertz. So right now, as you digest your lunch, you're placing 10 to the 18 parts a second. Not as a metaphor, just literally, which means you're making about 100 supercomputers a second. So your fabricational complexity is this spectacular ability to code construction. And what I want to talk about is bridging the boundary between those. So I'm happy to take credit for the observation that computer science is one of the worst things ever happened to computers or to science. Um, th th I said that in an early TED talk. This was a later TED talk um, I did to explain that. And what I mean is something very straightforward, which is as a computer scientist, you're taught these are models of computation. Each of this is one model of computation you can learn about. To a physicist, this is nonsense. This makes no sense um, because these are all pretend. They're all fiction. As a physicist, there's only one model of computation. Uh, a patch of space occupies space. It takes time to transit for causality. It admits interaction and persistence of state. Um, that's all there is. Anything other than that is pretend. It's made up. And at some point, you have to go from the pretend world to the real world. So uh, this is the original sin in computation. Um, Turing's machine was never meant to be an architecture. It was done for a proof of a Hilbert problem on computability. And there's a fundamental mistake in the Turing machine, uh, which is the head is distinct from the tape. So persistence of state is distinct from interaction. Okay. And we heard earlier today about how 90% of the work of the computer is done is shuttling memory. Um, the memory transistors have the same computational power 
as the processor transistors, but the tape is being brought to the head to interact. You can't interact in the memory, you have to interact with the head. In, in turn, uh, von Neumann wrote beautifully about profound things. He never wrote about what's called the von Neumann architecture. And uh, the only thing he really wrote about it is a dreadful document. He, he wrote a memo on programming the EDVAC, this pile of stuff, which was a very early computer, full of constraints. The memo was hacks to make this work. And we've been living ever since with the legacy of those hacks. And so these two things have served as bedrocks for decades of the growth of computing. They're very unphysical and they're historical anomalies. I, I didn't work with them directly. I worked once removed. I worked with each of their students so I could ask them what they were thinking. And these really were accidents. Uh, we kind of went off the, we had a good few decades, but we went off the rails with these, with these assumptions. And so this is my view of the state of the art. It's metropolis. It's um, programmers get to frolic in the garden and then the people in this room are in the basement moving the levers. And um, you have to figure out how to make the levers move so whatever happens in the garden happens. And roughly that, that's the state of the art today. So, uh, CBA was started to look at crossing the boundary between digital and physical and so we did things thinking about how computation become physical like uh, the first really significant faster than classical quantum computations or cryptography and materials or uh, universal logic in Navier-Stokes and fluidics. Uh, one of the projects that's actually relevant for today is that uh, analog versus digital is a false dichotomy um, we showed you can use analog, so if you think of a digital system, the state space is a hypercube, you can use analog device degrees of freedom to go into the inter interior of the hypercube, and instead of LNA A to D DSP, you can essentially quantize on codes and using analog device degrees of freedom to significantly improve um, power, latency, performance. And the people who worked on that relevant to what we're going to talk about today looking ahead. A couple I want to note, um, uh, Ben started Lyric Semiconductor that ADI brought to do the analog logic. Uh, and then Jason and Rafi, two of my students, uh, Jason built and still runs all the computers at Facebook. And Rafi built and used to run all the computers at Twitter. Then he was hired uh, to reboot the DNC's computing. They had some issues. Uh, and this is sort of anomalous. I'm not, I don't consider myself a computer science and CB, scientist and CBA isn't a computer science program, but Jason and Rafi building those systems is because I taught them not to believe in computer science but to believe in physics. They have to take billions of dollars and megawatts and make information and you can't believe the you know, historical hardware software layering. So one of the things Jason's did is what to so all but killed Cisco's and HP's traditional server business. Uh, Jason led what became this open compute project where he refactored the data center. So instead of buying servers that compute, he broke it apart to the functional elements like processing and memory and power, and then let you recompose those elements at a much more uh, fundamental way to build a data center. And so those were just some of the historical things that came from revisiting uh, what is computation. Uh, I began thinking about this and the connection to AI when a number of years ago I was asked to do a, a, a keynote for the annual supercomputing meeting. And at that I was horrified by what you need to do for the lever movers in the basement to maintain the fiction of software. So if you look at you know, Infaniben bandwidth, if you look at cache concurrency, if you look at all of these issues in scaling um, hardware performance to maintain the fiction that the software is running in an unphysical world. Um, I was horrified by that and so that led to a project we did with DARPA at that point. So uh, source code, object code, executable code, processor. We all live and breathe this, don't really think about it. But what's odd about this is we're changing representations about five times. So to go from the specification of the problem to the implementation of the problem, you keep changing representation. And roughly so each of these is a historical division. Uh, if you zoomed a map from where we are now, you'd go, um, building, street, city, state, country, it's hierarchical, 
But when you zoom a map, you don't morph the geometry. And so it led us to wonder, why can't we do that for computing? And that's not a new idea. It's a very old idea. So there's a parallel history of computing outside the mainstream lineage that dates back to, you could, beginning with Maxwell and then Boltzmann and then Leo Szilard, um, passed through IBM with Ralph Landauer and Charlie Bennett, who has a strong MIT connection, uh, thinking about computing as physics, not computing in a pretend world, but computing in the physical world. So Char Charlie helped introduce how computers can be um, reversal. So Ralph showed uh, computing takes KT log two is the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so it, you have to compute to erase Charlie showed you can compute uh, below that by never erasing, by making Brownian computers that are completely reversible with Ralph Landauer had never uh, occurred. The real thermodynamic to limit uh, on computing is how long you're willing to wait to be how certain you are as a fluctuation dissipation limit. Uh, Banks wrote a beautiful thesis at MIT uh, showing that cellular automata are logically, co computationally universal. It was laboriously done by hand for the simulation, but just showing bits on a lattice with simple local update rules is a computationally universal system. Uh, um, Norm Margulis, Tom Toffoli had a really interesting stretch at MIT making computing hardware completely outside the mainstream lineage uh, that just simply did uh, these lattice states. And they were able to get spectacular supercomputer performance from simple systems. What really killed this off at the time is this is in the middle of Intel scaling, where you could either do this or just wait a year or two for Moore's Law to keep ticking over. Um, but now that we're at the end of that era, it's really time to revisit this. Uh, one more of the inspirations were uh, collaborators at HP. Uh, the Teramac was this really pioneering project, um, what was the year, 98, uh, where they wanted to make a computer where a significant fraction of the parts are broken. And so the, the computer was built simply around scaling. So Rent's rule, if you're not familiar, is in both biology and computing, a trade-off between pins on a package and functionality in the package. And there's a, um, a scaling relationship you see across many kinds of a system. So they simply made a system of uh, systems out of systems out of systems out of systems, simply scaling by Rent's rule, designed for a significant fraction of the parts to be broken. What was amusing is the FPGA vendors they were using, they asked to go far beyond the yield curve, where they were certain they would have lots of broken parts. The, the FPGA vendors couldn't do that to sell it to them because it would break their yield statistics, but they made a deal. They would give them the few that worked and they'd put all the rest on the loading dock and they could come uh, collect them from the loading dock. But it was a beautiful version of making a computer where a significant fraction of the parts are uh, broken as an architecture. And so in this project, building, this isn't really new, it's just building on that hundreds of years of evolution, uh, we took a model of computation based on propagation and interaction. So you explicitly represent uh, time and distance with tokens uh, that interact. And so it's a cartoon model of physics. Uh, we, we built that in versions that run on multi-core computers, sea of commodity processors, uh, native silicon, interesting device physics, but they all run the same software because all they need to do is uh, propagate the interactions. And we uh, built this stack all the way up to the blahs, which are the routines underlying high performance computing. And so it, here's one of the blahs, a dot product. And uh, so, in the, so what you're watching is the token propagation through this uh, distributed spatial computing model. And so one of the blahs is a dot product. The dot product contains a multiplier. The multiplier contains an adder tree. Uh, then the adder tree contains adders. And eventually you get down to the uh, gates and then the tokens. And this is what we wanted, the Google Maps fly through. So you can zoom all the way into the physics and you can zoom all the way out to the application, but you're, you're respecting geometry. And the other thing is in this world, the distance you travel equals the time it takes to travel equals the number of operations you can perform equals the amount you can store. Those, rather than being unrelated resources you price separately, they're all coupled through the constraints of the underlying physics. And then you can implement it in all these different systems and you don't really port it. All they need to do is 
Uh, this is one token per degree of freedom. This is virtualized at a small resolution. This is virtualized at a high, re high resolution. And so this is part of an exercise to, to really just do a do-over, to say we had a few good decades, but our model of computation is broken. If you start with physics as a model of computation, lots of things actually get easier. So in this world, you don't have to worry about parallelization or concurrency because ev everything's happening everywhere all, all the time. It sort of looks like data flow, but the data flow doesn't go to a scheduler. The picture is the program. Uh, it has interesting security implications because a lot of security vulnerabilities come from things that are supposed to be far apart computationally being close physically. Here, distance in the computation is physical distance. We found all kinds of things actually get much easier, not harder, when you actually bring space and time into the computation rather than uh, leaving that to the basement. So at that stage, we looked at, and this was a few years back, so we looked at you know, 90 nanometer CMOS implementation. Uh, propagating one of these tokens uh, uh, in 90 nanometers is at about a tenth of picojoule. And that number is um, not surprisingly, not accidentally, about the cost of a DRAM refresh. So the cost to do one DRAM refresh is to propagate one of these tokens. And in fact, one of the interesting ways to build this architecture is to put it into DRAM re refresh. So the 90% of the power of this computer that's doing the memory work isn't adding value to the computation, but each time you're pulling the data out from the memory and putting it back in, the transistors have the same computational power. You can do, be doing these sort of algorithms to be computing um, rather than viewing that as a segregated resource. So that's thinking about, and I would really argue for, get over Turing and von Neumann. It was a historical accident. They did profound things, but it wasn't to create computer architecture. We had a good run, but it's for a few decades, but it's from a bunch of Band-Aids. This is a good time to really redo thinking about computation as physicists. And lots of things you think are hard really become easy. But now I, I want to turn from that to how you build these things. And so I've been very interested in what we've been calling the idea of digital materials. Uh, Shannon wrote the best master's thesis at ever at MIT, Inventing Digital Logic, went to Bell Labs. And one of the, the few really profound things he did is at Bell Labs, people were trying to communicate better by reducing noise. He instead asked, how well can you communicate? And uh, showed the first threshold theorem. And threshold theorems weren't obvious. It was, I can communicate as a wave to you, or I can give you a symbol. If I give you a symbol, if the noise is above a threshold, you're doomed. But if the noise is below a threshold, for a linear increase in the resources representing the symbol, there's an exponential reduction in the error to decode it. Very few exponentials in engineering, that's the most important one. Von Neumann applied that to computing. Uh, Shannon worked on the differential analyzer, the room full of gears and pulleys from Vannevar Bush. Uh, and he was so annoyed he invented digital um, because that was a computer that got worse with time. Uh, von Neumann applied Shannon to computing to show you could compute reliably with unreliable devices, again with threshold theorems. Uh, State-of-the-art chip fab. Billion, billions of dollars of chip fab, the fab process is analog. You use a digital thing to design it, you make a digital thing, but the information is not in the materials. Errors accumulate. Um, this is nano Lego from my lab. Lego, like amino acids, has exactly the properties Shannon and von Neumann taught us, meaning a, a Lego tower is more accurate than a child assembling it because you can detect and correct errors. You don't need a ruler for Lego because the global geometry comes from the local constraints. You can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar materials. And you don't make Lego trash. Trash is an analog concept. You can disassemble Lego and build again. Those are exactly the properties of digital systems. Uh, and it's what amino acids do. So if you mix chemicals, a yield of a part per hundred is good. The ribosome elongating a protein makes an error of 1 in 10 to the 4. Uh, DNA replication adds an extra error correction step. That's an error of 1 in 10 to the 8. That's the exponential scaling of the ability to detect and correct errors. So there's a really close analogy between digital communication, digital computation, and digital fabrication, meaning 
not a computer controlling a machine that was invented in 1952 at MIT, but it's actually putting codes into the construction of the material. <laughs> so as a first step, we, we warmed up. Uh, DigiKey stocks 500,000 types of capacitors, 500,000 types of resistors, 500,000 types of inductors. But if you think about that, that's only th uh, three material properties, conducting, insulating, resistive. So we looked at how with just three part types you can make all of those by assembling little building blocks. And so uh, this is a design tool where you place blocks of simple material properties and they are making capacitors and inductors. And then it exports uh, construction codes for an assembler. And then let's see, is, I see some of my students here, I don't see Will, uh, but this is a uh, assembler, a first generation, this is just an SOIC pitch where this is like a child playing with Lego, it, it's only measuring relative to the lattice and it has a feedstock of this micro Lego and then you can assemble that to do um, 3D electronics interconnect. Uh, and uh, when you get to about one micron brick size, you match the density of uh, capacitance and magnetic fields and capacitors and inductors um, to make all the passive parts. And then with a few more part types, you can do three dimensional routing and so you can build three-dimensional interconnect. Uh, um, and that, in fact, inspired a project we're seeding with Andreas Sullivan from DARPA, uh, looking at discreetly assembling integrated circuits. So today, full custom design, very few people are left who can afford full custom design at scale. It's $100 million, takes a year. What we're looking at is if you can do micro-assembly of three-dimensional computing structures, when you make your full custom $100 million chip. Nobody does it at the transistor level, of course. You place IP blocks. And so the question is, can you physically place the IP blocks uh, as physical things rather than software things to, to construct chip-like things in three dimensions? <laughs> and so at this stage in the evolution, just in the short term, Rent's rule has an interesting sweet spot around a millimeter. So today in a millimeter, you can get a MCU, you can get an FPGA, you can get an EEPROM, just as waf wafer um, level chip scale packaging. And so if you look at the numbers, they're actually quite suggestive. So if you want to make a Intel i7 CPU and you make it out of this chip scale packaging assembled into three dimensional blocks, uh, the number of ops per second and the area it occupies and the cost it occupies all come out to the same answer which is you match the Intel CPU. Um, you need about 100 of the little pieces to make the big piece. Crucially assembled, not um, in 2D, not on a wafer, but as little building blocks in three-dimensional volumes. And so that's something we're setting out to do right away as a short-term thing. Um, the GPU is a little harder. If you take the 1080 Ti numbers, the, the little uh, MCU is about, you would need 10 to the 5. You're off by a factor of 10 to the 2 to be able to do the GPU this way. And so you need a factor of about 100 improvement of this uh, to be able to make that. And uh, a factor of uh, about 30 of that just comes from the clock speed difference between the little MCU and the GPU core. Um, and another factor of three or so you can get to um, with the finer grain parallelization in the GPU core to get that factor of 100. And these are, there are a number of things beginning to come out that are suggestive to be able to get there. And in fact, in this DICE project, one of the things we're eager for is to either locally develop something like this or, or build on one of those to be able to get the GPU density. Uh, but what this then leads to is um, uh, uh, with Andreas, we're looking at doing this for chip scale. And then with uh, DOE, with Argon, we're looking at doing this for exascale computing architecture. It leads to the idea of um, physically reconfigurable computing. So imagine a computing architecture where the assembler doesn't just build the computer and then you go away, but the assembler stays as part of the computer architecture. And instead of having switches in the FPGA, you have the physical reconfigurability of these building blocks. So you don't need to set an architecture that's an abstraction over many problems. You can build an architecture that works for a class of problems, but continually rebuild the architecture as you reassemble these building blocks. And so, again, we're looking at that at chip scale with DARPA and system scale with uh, DOE. Uh, to push that in my lab, we've been uh, uh, pushing the limits of ultra-fast laser micromachining to do extremely high density interconnect. There's a really interesting regime where 
ultra-fast laser pulses are stronger than inner atomic field, so you disassemble uh, sub-diffraction limit without heat-affected zones to do uh, sub-micron scale density interconnect. And one of the interesting things coming out of that is once you start to be able to do that, you can start to blur the boundary with a logic. And so what I showed you, it's conventional chip fab to make the millimeter size parts we're assembling, but we're starting to make our own logic devices once we make the feature sizes small enough. So in this physical construction system, beginning to look at bringing the logic in band to it as well as the uh, interconnect. So now if, if you're uh, convinced by that, you think that sounds great, but there's a big problem, which is if you look at uh, placement of the parts I'm describing, if you wanted to place the parts at the fastest rate parts are placed today, which I take as inkjet printing, so the droplet rate in inkjet, and you had a dynamic range of 10 to the 3 from the part size to the system size, it would take about a day to do that. And so that's quite reasonable. Um, but if you wanted a dynamic range of 10 to the 6, so the smallest feature size in all the physics of the system up to the largest spatial extent of the system, it would take 3 million years, which is a long time for output. Uh, you could try to parallelize, but that changes the prefactor, and so you're still thousands of years. So the biological solution is profound, which is ribosomes make ribosomes. So uh, your body, the number I gave you at the beginning is a cell can have 10 to the 5 ribosomes. And so that's where you get the 10 to the 18 parts per second. What the body is doing is not parallel fabrication. It wins by massively parallel serial fabrication with this core capability that has no place in traditional chip fab, which is exponential ring up. Once you have an assembler that can make an assembler, you build up exponential assembly capacity to do massively parallel serial fabrication. So uh, these are the amino acids. And what's interesting about amino acids is they're not interesting. <laughs> they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic or basic acidic. They, they themselves don't have interesting properties. But you can compose them to make that's how you smell, that's how you think, that's how you move. And crucially, you can uh, assemble them to make uh, ribosomes that then place amino acids that can then make more ribosomes. And so. This whole thing rests on the digital property that you can detect and correct codes. A second digital property is the global geometry comes from local constraints. There's no metrology or flatness of field. A third digital property is you can join dissimilar building blocks to get, get the functionality. And then the scalability crucially comes from the recursion of the ribosome can make a ribosome. And so, you can do that directly. My lab did the microfluidics for genome transplantation to make a minimal cell. You can engineer these directly, but you're limited to the biological material set. So one of the core projects in my lab now is uh, this. Uh, so th this was a funny exercise. We, we wrote a proposal to the DOD to reduce their whole technological supply chain to 20 parts. And the review came back, part standardization, while useful, isn't fundamental. And the person running that DOD office was so embarrassed, he invented a new DOD program called Blue Sky to fund things that break peer review. And what, what they funded was this. In, in biology, the primary sequence is the coding sequence. The primary sequence then becomes, the code doesn't describe the thing, the code becomes the thing. Uh, there are geometrical motifs like alpha helices, beta sheets. Those become tertiary structure, which are things like electron donors and acceptors. And then that becomes quaternary structures like uh, the motors that move your muscles or your synapses. So in the same sense, what we want to do is build all of technology out of 20 parts. You have properties that are conducting, insulating, uh, resistive, semiconducting, magnetic. We end up around a similar place, about 20 material properties discreetly assembled with constraints so you can detect and correct errors and get global geometry from local parts. You assemble them into functions that make modules and make systems. Um, when we started the project, we started at the bottom trying to work from here up and we're making very slow project progress. Instead, we started spiraling around the middle. So we're making mesoscale functionality that we assemble up into systems 
while we develop the technology to pr progress down to the building blocks. And so, and the focus of all of that is the self-assembly, an assembler that assembles itself. So uh, here's an example of what we're up to. Here's a little, so this is about the size of a penny. Um, this is a little micro robot and one rigid part you can just snap together to make a spatial structure. A flexible part bends. Two flexible parts makes parallel transports. Four of them is a four bar linkage. Um, with the magnetic parts in that, the magnetic parts are the actuators. Those in turn we're going to make out of still smaller parts later. Right now those are conventional just voice coil actuators. Um, that's enough to discreetly assemble a motor. And so we have a paper coming out uh, showing how you can build motors where you vary the size of the motor, the bandwidth, the degrees of freedom, all with just a few parts that you can compose to make any sort of motor. And what we're doing right now is this. Uh, er early on, we had uh, started viewing the assembler as uh, what I showed you in uh, this picture. Uh, this is, it's like a three-dimensional pick and place that has the feedstock of the micro parts. And that's how we got started, um, but that's a conventional machine. As we progressed towards making these micro assemblers, what we've ended up with is a design that much, looks much more like swarms of these little walker robots I showed you. And the walker robots have feedstocks of the parts, they, they snap together to make, make themselves and in particular to also make bigger robots that then make bigger structures that make bigger robots that make bi bigger structures to, 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 to build up this whole hierarchy of, of discrete assembly. And so this is what we're trying to build right now. In turn to do that, this is a design tool, a first generation design tool we developed. The design tool for this needs to describe a computation that communicates its own construction. <laughs> So you need to fully merge the design of communication, computation, and fabrication in one design tool. And so this is the first version of uh, plate, th th the blocks are schematics of the micro parts, and then this is the interconnect and the computation and the function to design a self-reproducing system. And what's interesting now is I started by complaining about von Neumann and Turing, not them, but the misunderstanding of what they did in computer architecture they both ended up exactly here. So the last thing von Neumann did was study self-reproducing automata. In fact, he invented cellular automata to do exactly this. He wanted to understand at heart the foundations of life. And so he studied as a theoretical problem a computation that communicates its own construction. And so the last thing I showed you was really an implementation of what von Neumann did by hand as a design workflow. Uh, the last thing Turing did was morphogenesis. And so he wanted to understand how genes give rise to physical form. And so he studied the problem of morphogenesis. So both of them ended their lives looking at computation as a physical resource. Computation not abstractly in the cloud, but computation that was embodied. They understood this. And it's newly timely. Science's breakthrough of the year last year was morphogenesis. This is spectacular work. This is a day in the life of a zebrafish. And so you start from uh, just the, the zygote and over the course of the day the zebrafish emerges. And what the spectacular work is you can trace the expression of every single gene and you can track the position of every single cell. So you can make this exquisite data set of how the gene gives rise to the zebrafish. It's still not understood, but the breakthrough is the rich data set. At the heart of this is one of the oldest parts of the genome, uh, morphogenes, uh, like Hox genes. And what's so interesting about the morphogenes are your genome doesn't store the fact that you have five fingers. Uh, it stores a developmental program and the morphogenes guide morphogens. And what the morphogens do is things like you propagate up a gradient or you do symmetry breaking. And the developmental program, which is really the only part of the genome you read out like a program as a sequence of instructions, when you run that program and you go through the developmental sequence, you get five fingers. Five is never stored anywhere. 
And there's two reasons for that that are very relevant to today's meeting. Just one is compression. You have a billion bases specifying a trillion cells, so you need to compress. But there's a much more profound one, which is almost anything you do with the genome, if you flip bases, either is inconsequential or fatal. It's very, very hard to do something in the genome that's interesting. But in the space of morphogenes, change is interesting. You can go from fingers to webs or five fingers to six fingers. It's a very interesting space to search. The heart of machine learning is representation. Uh, the breakthrough hasn't been in how to search. It's been in the data sets to search, the ops to search, but really deep networks are building representation of where to search. And the heart of evolution is this beautiful abstraction. You don't represent the design ever. You represent a program that produces the design, and then you search over the programs that produce the design, that fundamental abstraction. So evolution is misrepresented. It's far from random. It's searching over developmental programs which, which let you discover the enormous complexity. And so there's a very interesting DARPA program we're part of. Uh, Jan Vandenbrund ran math and optimization and geometry at Boeing. He came to the conclusion that was so broken, he gave up and went to DARPA to redo design. And what we're doing in that is morphogenesis. So we're, we're working on the design of electromechanical systems where you don't design it, you search over developmental programs that give rise to form, uh, doing morphogenesis um, to be able to handle designs of uh, enormous complexity. And there's a lot I could tell you about what's going on to implement that. So stepping back, uh, Gordon Moore made the most famous graph in history. On the top are his five points. He went way out on a limb and said, what if this goes for a decade? The one thing he got wrong was it was five decades. And so this is five decades, as you all know, it's, it's rolling off. There are many ways to measure digital fabrication scaling. This is one simple one, which is just the spread of Fab Labs, something I'm very involved in. This is 10 years of Fab Lab spreading. And they've been scaling. There's more data for this than Gordon had when he did Moore's Law. This has come to be called Lass's Law for Sherry Lassiter. There's a kind of Moore's Law emerging for going from digital to physical, the same kind of exponential scaling. And I would disagree with, I, I would agree with everything in this meeting but one, which is 10 years, which is um, that was 10 years and it actually was 50. What we should really be doing today is this is already 10 years of this. What if this is 50 years? What does it mean to think about 50 years of that scaling? And I would argue one implication is it's not a lightweight thing to be post von Neumann. It's Turing and von Neumann really set us off in the wrong direction. It's time to do a do-over and think about computation based on physics. And it's very suggestive you can make that work. And in turn, in the very short term, instead of architectures for just AI, you can think about architectures that are physically reconfigurable. So you don't just use fab to make AI, you use AI to make the fab physically reconfigurable computing. But ultimately, the real impact of putting AI and hardware in the same sentence isn't slightly better machine learning, it's embodying AI. And embodying AI, we, we are the result of embodied AI. Evolution, in the way I described, does every single thing we've ever learned about machine learning. The net result is production of systems of enormous complexity, us, and the ability to solve profound problems, again, us. And so AI for hardware is much more than just better hardware for machine learning. The, the, so today has been so far all about you do fab to make AI, but the real profound opportunity is you do AI to make fab. By AI has a mind-body problem, it doesn't have a body. Once you embody it, you can have all of these impacts for AI itself, but in the opposite direction, you can profoundly bring intelligence into the physical world. So with that, I'll thank you and take questions. Yeah. Uh, why you particularly? Oh, so that, well, th there's two answers to, so why 20? Um, th there's a deep answer which isn't mine, which is there's been beautiful work 
uh, by somebody at NIST on Y20 in biology. And there's a very interesting trade-off in the thermodynamic cost versus the coding cost. You, you can trade off a bunch of degrees of freedom to see Y20 in biology. In our case, we're not trying to do this abstractly, we're trying to do this empirically. Like we start, so you know, if, if you wanted to make this, uh, you need conducting and insulating to do the PCB layers and the vias and the connectors and the interconnect and then the passive components. You need one more block to do the resistive components. Um, to make the ro micro robots, we needed a, a, an elastic degree of freedom and a magnetic degree of freedom. And so it's just a step at a time we've been adding um, these degrees of freedom as we tackle problems with it. And it just happens to be coming out in the ballpark of 20. Have you thought at all about using fractal geometry to inform the morphogenesis and the designs of those? So you said fractal? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, the way you can view, so in, in the thing I showed you on the morphogenesis, what I didn't explain is uh, that's based on, we've redone multi-physics simulation where you can merge the search deeply with the simulation with represents, representations of designs algorithmically. So you don't represent the design than an algorithm. Then you have to do very efficient, very high dimensional search over that stack with then an evaluation to close that was all going on in that. And so the way it relates to your question is, I think of what we're doing is not reverse engineering biology, but forward engineering biology. In a sense, we're sort of driving biology. And so we're not imposing fractal or any other assumptions on the geometry. We're making a world where that can emerge. And so biology is full of fractals. But, but again, if you go back to, you know, bones are beautiful fractal structures, but the fractal isn't stored in the genome, it's sort of a process that gives rise to the fractal. And so we want to discover that, not Im impose that in, in what we're doing. And in fact, in doing that, I should note, the hardest part of that project so far has been once we built all, this, all those stacks together, the evolutionary process we're building really likes to cheat. And so when we give it cost functions to solve problems, it keeps finding bad ways to solve the problem that do the goal we gave it, but it cheats to get there. And so it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a sneaky student. And so in many ways, the hardest thing in the stack is um, it, it's not hands off. There's a person crucially in the loop as a mentor to keep the training process from, from cheating and going off the rails to meet the, the letter, but not the spirit of the cost function. 